Hi, this is Kathy Drew from Genus Bernina Sewing Center here in beautiful Knoxville, Tennessee. Today, we're going to be helping you make a beautiful table runner. This would be a great project for the beginning quilter, so don't be afraid to start. And if you're in the mood to teach your children how to sew, I think you'll enjoy doing that as well. It'll be a good project for them. We're gonna be using some lovely border prints, and it's gonna be an easy table runner for you to make. We're gonna start at the cutting and we're gonna finish with quilting and binding. So be sure and watch all the parts of the video and you can actually do a stitch along with me. All right, first off, let's talk about some of the things that I always have on hand and I think you should too before you start your project. One of the things of course will be your fabrics, your border prints, but you're also gonna need a pattern. This particular pattern is by the quilting company What's the lady's name on the front? Oh, and I've got Brandy here with me. She's okay. helping me. Yeah, she's helping me. And it is called the Easy Strip Table, Easy Striped Table Runner. I'll get it out in a minute. It's early <laughs> in the morning and I haven't had my second cup of coffee. You can really make this any length you want it, but her particular pattern gives you the yardage and everything that you need to make one that's about 16 by 45 inches. Now, what you'll also need in addition to this pattern is you will need a 60 degree triangle ruler. This is a Creative Grids ruler, and this is what we're going to be using to uh, cut some of the corners and things for our pattern. Okay, so we got to have one of those. We also have the anniversary pattern, mm -hmm. which comes with more table yes. runner options, right? Comes with some additional options with her new anniversary pattern. Now, on the back of any of my specialty rulers and also on my basic 6 by 24 inch rulers, I like to use uh, these strips and all these things that I'm showing you, you will find in a link of our video so that you'll be able to look them up if you need them. But these will adhere to the back of your ruler, and which is so beneficial in preventing you from having slipping when you're trying to be accurate with your cutting. Without that accuracy, you're going to have issues to where things are not going to line up correctly. So I think you'll enjoy having these, and I'll put them on all my rulers. You'll really enjoy it. See your ruler so I can show yeah. them up close. Which one, the 6 to 24 yeah. on the back? You're going to show them the back of it? Here we go. Can you guys see the little ledge? Yeah, and it grips really well. And you can cut those strips in any length you need for any ruler. And that's what we're going to be using for this. Okay, doll. You also are going to want to treat your fabric. I do, because uh, some of the pieces are going to be cut on the diagonal. Can you show this mm -hmm. too for them, Brandy? Because these are going to be cut on the diagonal, that will also mean they're on the bias. And if you don't treat that fabric, and starch is okay, but treating it with this product called Terial Magic is the only way to go. This stabilizes that fabric and does not allow it to stretch. So Brandy and I are crazy about Terial Magic, it's and most everybody price. else that uses it loves it too. So I think you'll enjoy it also. Let me give you a little sip of water. <laughs> you can also see that there's no fraying. None whatsoever. So it does kind of eliminate that on some mm -hmm. of those fabrics that you get that fray quite a bit. Let's see if we've got one. I hate to undo your pretty uh, see, see, see all these little frays of the fabric that you get whenever you're, whenever Come you're uh, the way, guys. doing your work. Yeah. Let's see if we can get back here and see how your threads, your edges of your fabric begin to fray off. So if you treat your fabric with the Terial Magic before you do any of the cutting, then you will not have any of that. And that used to drive me crazy when I would quilt for people because I would spend hours clipping all those loose threads so it wouldn't show through on the quilting. So you simply uh, spray it and Brandy and I like to recommend that you buy these misters and of course she said the other day oh you were spraying this stuff all over <laughs> everywhere well yeah kind of sort of but you can see that it makes just a mist instead <laughs> i think this ball's got a hole in it but it actually will make a mist instead of a squirt 
so you get better coverage on your fabric and it also saves on product as well. So my fabric was treated with the Terial Magic and you can see how, how nice and flat and straight. It will make such a big difference in your piecing. Okay, so what I'm gonna be cutting on today has already been treated. Now, once you treat the fabric, you don't use the Terial Magic anymore. It's not used for pressing your seams or anything like that. And we like to use Best Press. So when you need to have a little bit of that moisture uh, to maybe make a seam lay flat, then we just give it a little spritz with this. And I also keep mine in a mister. Like I said, it's going to save product for you. So but these are great with the things. Mister. You will love when you see the difference that it makes in the projects that you work on. And by the way, I just read an article about Terial Magic on uh, making t-shirt quilts. If you spray that t-shirt before you cut it, it stabilizes it and doesn't let it shift. So give it a good spray with that. I also use the uh, Terial Magic for embroidery. So we'll talk about that in another video. The other thing you might want to have for when you're pressing your seams, and I like to keep a small iron by me at my work table. That way I don't have to get up and down to walk to the ironing board. <laughs> Heaven forbid I get more exercise or more steps in in a day than I need. So we're just going to use a small iron. My favorite one is the Aliso iron. If you want to use steam, you just flip the little lid in the back, pour your water in, your distilled water if you want to use it. And then you have several temperature settings that you can use. And also you have a spritz option as well and a steam burst. So that's a handy little iron to take to classes with you or just keep close by the machine so you don't have to have a big old ironing board there. I also have a hardwood clapper, and what I'll, you'll probably see me use it when we do our pressing demo, and the hardwood clapper will trap the heat and the steam, if you're using steam, between the ironing surface and the clapper, and you'll get a much better result with your pressing. If you want to use pins when you sew, I highly recommend you buy some of the Magic Pins. I prefer the smaller silk pins, and uh, they really uh, slide or glide through your fabric easily without causing shifting. You can get them in various sizes, but remember, sometimes the larger the size of the pin that you get, the larger the needle uh, is and it's harder to push it through your fabric. So I like to use the silk ones whenever I'm doing piecing and I have to You can to iron those too, and right? You can, you can iron over these and they won't melt. Plus they're very easy to pick up, you know. They have a nice very rubber easy. tip to them. Mm -hmm. And they do come in a little store. Yeah, case they have a cute little case to keep all your stuff in. Perfect. All right, so we've covered those. Uh, you're gonna need a wonderful rotary cutter. Everybody has their favorites. This is one of mine, mainly because of how you can change the blade. I was always getting the parts out of order. So with this one, all you do is you pull back and then this falls out. You put a new blade on top put it back in and lock it. So I love this rotor cutter and uh, it fits my hand well. And hey, did you guys know what, that these uh, ridges that you see on the rotary cutter, when you're using the cutter, you actually should have your index finger there. So the end of the cutter rests in the palm of your hand, your index finger goes there and then you roll. Okay, just throw that little tip in there. Oh, that's a good that's tip. That's a small Tip. We help new quilters every day learn mm -hmm. how to do that cutting. And like I say, you know, there's there's a rotary cutter for everybody. If you have problems with your hands, there's some that are more ergonomic as well. Now, the thread that I always use when I do my piecing is I use the Orofil 50 weight thread. I use it especially because it's a very fine thread. Doesn't bulk up my seams at all. And I'm also able to use a smaller needle size when I do my piecing. And so the needle size that I like to use is a size 70 needle. I prefer Microtex needles. They have a long thin point and they pass through the fabric very easily. And you can get the new chrome plated ones uh, that increases the longevity of the needle. Okay, so 
four piecing Microtex size 70 with RFL 50 weight thread. Now, if you use a different brand of thread, that needle size may change. Okay, so this is the combination that I always use and that I recommend. All right, next thing, get you a nice pair of scissors to go by. Mm -hmm. You want one that will give you a good clean cut when you do have to cut away any snips or edges and so forth. And if you've done that, I think you're pretty well set up. I have pressing mats by my machine. And of course, everybody is loving the really thick wool pressing mats. And so that's what I always have by my machine with my Aliso iron. One thing I wanted to tell you too, the Aliso comes with this a little silicone pad that you can sit your iron on when you're not using it. If you want to stand it up, you can. You just have to make sure that you turn the cord off to the side if you want to stand it up. But if you want to just let it sit down, then this is what the pad is for. Another thing too is for storing it when you're not using it. And this is hard for me to do. Do the tip first. Do the tip first. Yep. So that's gonna be the best there way. There you go. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have very good hands anymore. We're busy. We don't ever put it away anyway, there right guys? Then you can actually hang it on a little hook if you need to. Okay. Yeah. I think I've got you covered. We're going to talk about your sewing machine. If you're a quilter, you just need a straight stitch machine. I'm sewing on the beautiful Bernina 770 Quilters Edition today. And in the course of some of these videos, we'll be bouncing around between different machines. I love this machine because it has wonderful features for quilters. We can personalize this machine to the technique that we're doing. And we'll talk about those in the course of the sewing. What I also have is Bernina's 97D presser foot. Now, the D means it works with those machines that have dual feed. And I love having the dual feed for my piecing. What dual feed will do for you is it will feed the top layer of your fabric at exactly the same speed as the feed dogs are moving the bottom. So no more shifting of those pieces to where when you get to the end, the top piece is shorter or, or is usually longer than the bottom. So always, if you have a machine, a Bernina machine that has dual feed on it, make sure you always buy the D feed. You will not regret it. The dual feed on our machine just simply slips into the back of the foot. It's very easy. Now this particular foot was designed by Quilters for Bernina so that it will fit the nine millimeter feed dogs that we have on the machine. This is the guide that you uh, slide up against the side of the foot that you will guide your fabric by. I guess I need to find my screwdriver so that I can get that slid up. It's still tight. Anyway. This will slide back and forth up against the foot. And when we get started, I'll show you how to put it on. I gotta find the little screwdriver. I think I left it out front. But then you'll butt your fabric up against it. And uh, this is a great guide to have even when you're not using this foot. It will help you do like inch hems because it is adjustable as far as the distance away from the needle. Okay, so I hope that helps you guys. And we are gonna get ourselves ready to show you how to use this wonderful ruler and do some rotary cutting, okay? Let's talk just a little bit about the pattern before we go any further with the cutting. So uh, once again, this is by Karen Montgomery and it's called the Easy Striped Table Runner. And this is her anniversary edition, so when you look at the back of the pattern, you're gonna see that she's got some variables on what you can do uh, with her pattern. And uh, this particular one is like what we're gonna to make today. Here it is in the poppies. Here we have the snowman. And then you can see this is one of her variations to where you have this beautiful piece in the center. Now you're gonna have some leftover triangles that you've cut. So you could actually use this for a table topper if you wanted to, or you could also use it for a small placemat. I didn't see any reason for that. There's so many, look how pretty that turned mm -hmm. out in the center right there. Maybe now this bit. one over here is Jamie's. And I had her deliberately not sew hers together because I wanted you to see 
the different parts to hers. So remove that and you'll see that she's taken six of the triangles, stitched them together to form a circle, then added a triangle here, repeated it, the process, and when you put them all together, this is what you get. Isn't that cool? So you've got lots of variations in this pattern, but to start out, we're gonna do the basic, just to get you going on how to get started with it. Okay, so this is a fun pattern. Great gifts for people, start early. Now the fabric that I picked out was the Chickadee. I'm not sure, it's probably got a little bit more to that name than that, but I just thought this was such a pretty fabric and it would be something that you could use for the holidays, but you can also use it all winter long. It just is so sweet. So what you want to do when you get your fabric, and of course this has been cut on, it's a 45 inch wide piece normally, but you can lay your ruler down and actually audition the fabric as to where you want the chickadees to lie or maybe not move it up too far to where you get a little piece of a chickadee that you cut off. So you can audition your fabric that way. Now this ruler is eight and a half inches from the top to the bottom. It also has a blunt tip and that's what you want because that's gonna help you when you start seaming it together. So like we said, this is by Omnigrid and you can follow the link that's gonna be uh, on the video to help you purchase this for your sew along. Okay? And the fabric, all mm -hmm. the fabrics mm -hmm. are available online. Everything, Brandy's gonna have it all set up for you guys. No now, <laughs> what I did, just so I can make my first cut, because we're going to need, for this table runner, we are going to need two strips that we are going to cut triangle units from also. So, let me move this, so maybe it, we'll just throw that in the floor, because we can. <laughs> Okay, so this is one long strip, and we're going to add a triangle unit to each end. So we've got to do some cutting here. We've got to get some triangle units, and then we have to get a diagonal edge onto each end of our strip. Okay, so we're going to make two of these. Get, get, uh, cut two strips and four of the triangle units for the basic table runner. Okay, so I have pre-treated my fabric with Terial Magic, and then that way, that's going to stabilize this fabric, not allow it to stretch as we're sewing across the bias, and look, no frays off those edges. So it's going to make your sewing so much easier and so much neater, okay? Now, this is a shorter strip. She will give you the exact measurement to cut the strip. I want to think it was, let me look, just to make this a, a good sew along. Let's look. <laughs> my, my memory doesn't serve me well anymore. So let's see what she says, just to make it, just to clarify it for you. She's got great instructions, and it says you're going to be cutting an eight and a half inch wide strip, which we've already talked about that. And... The length of the fabric. There you go, across the width. Now, if your border print runs down the length, you can make it any length you want to. And look, look at these instructions, Brandy. She's got beautiful pictures. And I can follow a pattern if yeah. I can. You might want to follow it better if it's right side up, not <laughs> upside down. But see, you've got some really good instructions. And look right down here is what we're getting ready to do. We're going to use our triangle ruler and we're gonna start cutting. All right. Let me get that out of my way. So we're gonna cut this. Excellent. With my triangle ruler, which yep. is right here. Okay. All right, so you're gonna lose a little bit of this edge. Okay, but that's okay. You're gonna line the bottom of your ruler up with the bottom of your fabric and the top Blunt tip is what you want on this ruler. Really, if we had thought and got a rotating cutting mat, this might be easier. So I'm going to cut. And there again, I've got those grip strips on the bottom of my ruler so I don't have to worry about things shifting. Here you go. And you're going to cut that little top off, right? 
I won't have to because I cut my strip okay. exactly eight and a half inches. Let me pull. There we go. There's one side. Now, what you are going to have to do, now these are going to be the two strips that we're going to use at the end. But we have got to get the right angle, the correct angle on the end of our strip so that when we are ready to sew it, they will fit together. So we're going to have to cut a couple more. We're going to cut right through here. Okay. And these are the ones you're not going to use for the table runner, but you can save them to use maybe for a, a, a nice little table topper. We did that. Let me show you what we got here. So this is the side we're going to attach it to. And we had to have this angle to make it work with our triangle. Now those that we are not going to use... Our chickadees would be up the dam. Yeah. Okay. okay. So we save these for another project. And she's got many of them in that little pattern. Lots mm -hmm. of good ideas for you in that pattern. Okay. So that's how you get started. Sorry, that just fell right off of me. So you're going to have two strips. And you're going to cut each of those strips exactly like this. You'll have two usable triangles and two to save for another project. All right. We're going to get ready, and we are going to sew and make this table runner. So, we'll be right back. Okay, so uh, I think I'll go through a little bit of machine setup with you. And uh, we'll do some threading and, and talk a little bit about the presser foot that I love to use. But the first thing I want to tell you is, look at this fabulous light that the Bernina has. Well, it is so fabulous that... For the videos, we're going to have to turn it off it's because bright. it kind of creates a glare for Brandy, doesn't it? Yeah, but you're okay. going to be using the slim light, right? Yeah, so there you go. Just know that you can adjust the brightness of the light, but you can also turn it off so it works out great for the videos. So I think you'll be able to see a little bit better. Now, this is the presser foot that I was talking about that I love to use for my piecing. I have found that when I use this presser foot, the accuracy is much improved. It is designed to fit the nine millimeter feed dogs of the machine. Now, the original quarter inch presser foot, presser feet rather, number 37 and 57, uh, they were not as wide as this foot. So, a part of the feed dogs was not making contact with the foot to feed your uh, fabric straight and accurately. They work great on the 5.5 millimeter machines, but for our nine millimeter, you're gonna really enjoy having this foot. It is designed to be used in, uh, on your machine with the dual feed engaged. Now the dual feed extends down from the back of the machine and the end of it actually will go into this cut out opening of the presser foot. That allows the dual feet to actually make contact with the top layer of your fabric. So it moves at exactly the same time and with the motion of the feed dogs on the bottom. So both layers of your fabric will be fed equally under the presser foot. So when you forget to engage the dual feed, you're going to get puckering in your fabric because without the dual feed in that slit, that's a big open area and the fabric puckers up on you. So if you're like me and you forget that sometimes and you wonder why on earth is my machine puckering my fabric, reach your hand back there, give it a love pat, make sure you've engaged your dual feed. We're going to slide him on and I'm going to go ahead and do that right now. All right, so I won't forget. Now, what I love about this foot is this adjustable guide that you can put on the machine base. You have two holes on the machine right here that you can attach different attachments that Bernina has made for this machine. This guide can be used for other things besides with this foot. So the foot comes with a guide on most of the nine millimeter models and you can use it for additional things things as well. Let's say you wanted to put a hem in something. You can move that guide away from the needle and actually butt the bottom edge of your fabric against it and use it as another means of getting a nice straight 
uh, stitch. Now, the thing you have to realize about the Bernina attachments is they make things look more professional because they give you the accuracy that you need. So I'm going to go ahead, whoops, hang on there, little screw. I'm going to put the screw in the hole closest to the presser foot. And I am not going to tighten it down all the way at this point. I am going to tighten it down enough. And then I'm going to lower the presser foot and slide the guy. Oh, another thing, Brandy, I got to take it off. I'm going to show them something else too. Okay. I don't want them to be afraid about their feed dogs rubbing on this because Bernina has notched out an area. Can you see it if I put it on my hand? Mm -hmm. And that notched out area will prevent the feed dogs from making contact with the metal of this guide. Aren't they amazing? Mm -hmm. They think of everything because we don't want to damage those feed dogs and dull the teeth. So I've got the foot down partially. I'm going to put the um, foot up against it. And then I want to raise and lower that foot to make sure that it's going to move easily on that. All righty. Well, I think we have a go. You don't want to press it up there really tight. You just want it to be pressed enough to where you can tell. Uh, you don't want the foot to move. In other words, you don't want to push it up against that foot so hard that you see the foot kind of tilt on you. And then tighten him down. Now, what I'm doing... Um, uh, quilting, if I have to ever sew on the diagonal rather than just a straight line, which most of our patterns are done for, but let's say I'm making a half square triangle, you don't necessarily have to take this off. You can just unscrew it and turn it out of your way. You know, do those pieces that you need uh, to do some other type of stitching other than a straight line, quarter inch. Okay. Let me double check that. Yep, he's moving good. We are ready to make it. Now we're okay. going to do our threading, right? We've still got to get a thread Yes. Okay. We're going to do some threading. Put this pretty piece of fabric under there so everybody can see it. Now, I have got uh, the Aurifil 50 weight, and how do you know what it is? If you look on the bottom of the spool, the 50 weight always has the orange uh, um, spool, and it says Aurifil Mako, and then 50 forward slash to ply and look at how fine of a thread that is and it may be fine but it's extremely strong it's made of extra long staple cotton so you've got a lot of strength in that thread even though it's fine we're going to go ahead and thread it up now when i'm using the large spools like this on my machine i use the smaller spool cap and that holds it better than the big one, which lets the spool rock up and down. And the other thing about you know, that spool rocking up and down is it can affect your stitch quality. You'll, you'll feel like the stitches are maybe pulling the fabric every now and then. And you want this to be able to slide freely off the end of that spool. So I put the tiny one on. I don't know if you saw that. And I just dropped it. Of course I did. There it is. I'll show you guys some patterns. So At this least is the it did. <laughs> we're working on you guys while she's hunting that down. How about I can. That? <laughs> All right. Everybody has it happen. <laughs> so we're going to put the teeth in to the spool, not just but the blunt end up. Can you see that over my arm? Mm hmm. And then when I've done that, look how secure that spool is. And when thread, the spools are laying horizontally like this, which they always should be for the cross wrap threads. It just falls off the end. Then we go in the guide in the back. Always make sure that when you are threading your machine, your presser foot is in the up position. So the tensions are open in the top. We're gonna floss him in. Always want to thread your machine with the presser foot completely up. And then, of course, the 7 Series has a wonderful needle threader. I always tell everybody, try not to make it too complicated. You're going to press the needle threader down halfway, and you'll see this post. You go under it from the right side of the post. I'm trying to stay out of Brandy's way here. And then across in front. Can they see that? Mm-hmm. Then I'm going to push, push 
you'll feel the first push, you'll feel it bump up against the back of the needle, and a lot of people stop at that point. Give it an extra push, because there's a little wire that needs to go through the eye of the needle from the back, and then you're gonna glide it into the threader, and when you release and pull up, don't have a death grip on that thread or else it can't pull it out of your hand. Then you get a big loop of thread in the back. All righty, perfect. We are almost ready to sew. And again, I always put, make sure that my needle thread is under my presser foot, not on top. Okay. So I have already, it's kind of like on the cooking shows, you know, they always have something already baked. I've already an attached on this side. The process is the same for each end of your strip. We're gonna match up our bottom and we're gonna match up that blunt tip at the top. And if you want to pin it, by all means, put your little pin in there, there's nothing wrong with that. And then we're gonna, I notice how I'm trying my best to keep my diagonal lines even. And this will just make a lot of people feel more secure to have those pins in there, especially if you're a beginner. Ready? Of course, I'm gonna remove my pin here. And, oh, you know what? Another thing, if you sew on one of these machines, another thing that I always do, I don't want it to secure at the beginning and at the end when I'm piecing. So let me show you very quickly on the screen how you can go into your settings. Let me get out so you can see. The little gears on the front on all the Berninas represent the machine settings for the machine. We are going to go into settings and there's a picture of a straight stitch and a zigzag and this is where you can change sewing settings. So we're going to go in there and where you see the needle with a little knot under it, if you see the green line like green for go, that means that your securing stitches are engaged and turned on. I turn them off. Okay, then that way it doesn't sit and sew in place and it allows you to start sewing exactly on the edge of the fabric with having, without having to worry about uh, fraying that end off. And I also forgot to mention too, Brandy, I put a straight stitch throat plate cover on there okay. and uh, that does not have the large oval opening and with that straight stitch throat plate cover, it won't allow the edge of your fabric to fall down into the throat plate of the machine. All right, so since we're talking about that, why don't I just show it to them so they can see. We'll move this aside. Let me take my presser foot off so they can see. So the straight stitch throat plate cover has a very tiny hole in it that allows the, only the needle on a straight stitch to pass through. Now, your regular nine millimeter throat plate cover has this wide oval opening. So you can see that that definitely gives enough room for the edge of your fabric to be pushed down in that hole by your needle. So when you use a straight stitch throat plate cover, you don't ever have to worry about that happening. Uh, I remember years ago when we didn't have this type of throat plate cover, we all would sew on a scrap of, uh, piece of fabric first before we approached the part that we were actually working on, and that way it wouldn't knock it down in the hole. <clears throat> so everybody that does any kind of piecing is going to want to have that on their machine. Uh, it is worth the investment to have it. And a lot of the Quilters Edition machines that Bernina makes uh, come with that. All right, make sure I engage my dual feet so we won't get any puckery seams. And let me put this pin back and kind of make sure. So I've got everything lined up. We want that top edge to be even with the top of our fabric. And which stitch are we using? We are using stitch number one, and I went to my quilt program where it has stitch 1326, which is preset at a shorter stitch length for piecing. Mm -hmm. Now, you can go into your quilt program, and you can see a multitude of stitches that will work 
for any quilting you do and you've got your applique stitches these are crazy quilt stitches so if you wanted to uh, use those over a seam and so you've got tons of different stitches that pertain to quilting in the quilt program of stitches so we just uh, chose stitch number 1326 because it's preset at the correct stitch length for piecing your quilt together and like I said earlier that will prevent the ends of your seams from pulling open and all right 2.0 mm -hmm. and that's yeah that's preset for that when you go in the quilt program otherwise if you just use your basic sewing program uh this is your i think they call it well i don't know what they call it but anyway it's just your everyday sewing stitches uh this is not preset at that length now see you can see it's yellow where i showed how to alter it but if i hit clear its preset is 2.50 which is two and a half and that's more for like garment construction so we went into the quilt program but if you wanted to alter that you could but we just went into the quilt program and we selected stitch 1326 and there we go it's preset for piecing all right now i'm firm on holding your two threads in your hand when you start to sew just for two or three stitches that prevent when you have a long thread tail like i do here and you let the needle go down without holding it it can take too much excess thread tail down with it and it will uh lock your gears because it wraps around the hook now bernina has a sensor on there so that if that happens it stops you from continuing to sew and a lot of people get aggravated by that sensor but it's just there to help you but if you'll just take a couple of stitches while holding your thread you won't have a bird's nest on the bottom and you can see how easy this guide makes it for uh, lining my pieces up and knowing that as long as I keep that edge up against the guide, I'm not, I'm going to have a perfect quarter inch. The one thing I would caution you about is a lot of people will push too hard. And if you push too hard or you're trying to really make sure you're up against the edge and you push too hard, can you see that little buckle in the fabric? If you push too hard and you get that buckle, that's going to throw off your quarter of an inch. Most of your guiding, whenever you're sewing, should be from in front of your presser foot. You should not have the weight of your hand to the left. You don't have to push and it should feed straight. So I just got a light touch in front of the presser foot and I'm just going to guide that edge and there again that terial magic is going to prevent this from rippling on us when we get through. You're going to see a beautiful seam and I slowed my machine down. I could sew faster than that but for the sake of the camera and everything I've just slowed it down a little bit and I have a little purple thing that's what they call this i prefer a stiletto but these work great also and it can help you because sometimes your fingers get too large to help do the guiding and you can just put your purple thing right there and continue to guide that right on into the edge all right and i'm going to use my thread cutter and it will cut my thread and raise my presser foot for me and we have our end sewed on. Now you're gonna do that for both ends of your table runner, as you can see. I've already got this one sewn together. Now what I did on mine, when it came to pressing the seam allowances, on one of the strips that I had joined the two triangles on, I pressed my seam allowances toward the triangle now on this strip that i'm working on now i'm going to press away from the triangle and then that way when we sew this together they won't be on top of each other so i've got my little tools here i've got my little Alyssa iron so you can see it's handy to have her right by your machine i first always want to set my seam and I do so by just putting the iron on it and pressing it flat. This will help give you a much smoother um, seam. And now we're gonna press the seam toward our long piece away from the triangle. 
that make any sense. Now I'm gonna give it just a little spritz with this press to have a little moisture there. And I've got my handy clapper close by and I am just going to press it over and clap it. And like I say, that is just going to provide a lock to keep the heat and the moisture in. Isn't that unbelievable? Yeah. I always use this on uh, garment construction and never thought about using it in quilting, you know, but it works beautifully. Now I'm gonna double check from the right side to make sure that I didn't accidentally press a little bit of a fold in there. And look how nice and flat that is. Isn't that beautiful? All right, and so you always wanna check and make sure that you haven't inadvertently pressed a little bit of a fold in there because that's gonna throw off your matching. So I'm just gonna quickly go over that, use my little clapper, and you don't have to push down on the clapper, you can just lay it on there. That It's not the pressure that helps with your beautiful seam, it's just the uh, solid wood and it will keep that heat in there. How about that? Okay. All right. Now we are going to get ready and come back and we are going to get this ready to sew the two pieces together and do some pinning. Okay. We'll be back in just a bit. We are just moving along. Can you believe how easy this is, has been to make? So I've got my two panels ready, my two strips with their triangle uh, ends on, so we're ready to pin it together. After we get this pinned together, we're just gonna stitch the two panels together all the way to the bottom and your table runner top is finished and we'll be ready to uh, think about quilting it. So um, we're going to flip this right sides together and uh, what I want you to pay attention to, you know, we talked about how I press these seams. So on one of the strips, the seam allowances were pressed toward the triangle. On the other, it's pressed away from the triangle toward the long strip. That way, when we put these together, we can butt those seams up against each other like so, and we don't have all that bulk. Now, I generally pin before and after that intersection rather than trying to pin right through all those layers. So I just pin before and after. Let me get that lined up just a little bit better right there. And let's get that end pinned down because we don't want any shifting or anything taking place. We want everything to just be perfect. Now you use as many pins as you need to, as you're comfortable with. Don't worry about it. So it's not gonna hurt at all to put your pins in there if you're more comfortable. And I'm not normally a big pinner, but there are times when it's important. Now, when I get this side, butted and joined right here where our seams are, I'm going to double check between these seams. And I can actually just take my fingers and wiggle them back and forth, and you can feel those seams touch each other. And then I'll just press before and after. And there again, I love these pins because the needle on it is very fine. Makes it very easy to pin through. And then we'll put a little pin down here. This is just one thing to worry, less thing to worry about if you've got everything pinned in place. And then I kind of take it like this, guys. Line up those and give a little tug on it and find the center. If I can get a hold of that fabric right there and then line those up right there. Okay, I'm just scooshing it up. And now we know that we've got them ready. And there again, if you want to use more pins um, down along this long side, you know, go ahead, don't, don't worry about it at all. Use as many as it makes you feel comfortable. And then the more you get comfortable with your patterns and stuff, you will probably use less pins. And I don't know if I mentioned it, but we are using quarter inch seam allowances. <laughs> that be a good thing to talk about, isn't it? All righty. So now we're gonna sew this long panel together. And then after we've done that, we will press our seam allowances open. Get 
a chair up here. And I've got pins going in all directions. <laughs> I always have to take that one out. And just take your time when you're doing this. Find your thread again. Come here. Sometimes when you use your thread cutter, it's going to pull that needle thread down to the bottom because that's where your thread cutter is. So just locate it. And having that dual feed will help you also in being sure that you can sew and your pieces match up better. The big thing I see people uh, forget about is making sure that the two edges are lined up with each other. They let that bottom layer slip under. So you wanna kind of try to keep, keep contact with that and, and pay attention that you keep that guided perfectly. Now I'm gonna take this pin out, this pin out, and I can actually feel with my fingers that they're when they're lined up. So I'm gonna pull that down, I hope y'all can see, and just butt that up right there. And then I'm gonna hold it. Let me speed this up just a little bit, but we'll be here all day. <laughs> see how I'm pulling this fabric back so I can locate that edge that's hiding underneath? And then we're just going to continue on down that seam. And then again, I don't know if I mentioned too, you don't have to make yours the length that she recommends. I mean, you know, you could make it longer if you need a longer table runner for your table. So, you know. This is a pattern that's easy to adjust. Oh, very easy to adjust. And I also wanted to mention, so don't let me forget, Brandy, those leftover pieces, if you wanted to make like that little circular uh, tablecloth that I was talking about, or, you know, a little table topper, mm -hmm. I wanted to talk to them just quickly about laying that out and putting it together. There again, I see I'm sliding that over so I can locate that bottom edge of my fabric to make sure I keep those edges even. Notice how I'm keeping my hand in front of the presser foot. The weight of your hand can pull your fabric away from the needle and affect your seam allowance. So try to always be guiding from the front and keep your eye right here on your guide that you're keeping the edge on. I hate to kind of make them watch all of this, but... Uh, Don't they always want to sit um, right in front of the needle? A lot of people try yeah, to sit to the side of the yeah, needle. Yeah, definitely, because you'll get a backache. And you always want your foot control right in front of the leg of the foot that you're using. You don't want your foot control way out here. You want it to be right in front and um, you want to be centered directly in front of the sewing needle, not to where you have to do any tilting to see it. We're gonna let Kathy speed on that. I'm gonna show you the pattern one more time behind us. Mm -hmm. So we're currently working on this pattern, this watermelon pattern which is also done in the snowman and the poppy. I and then she's the gonna show you how to do some of these center pieces here. And then this is another one of the options. So just again, showing you the pattern. And let's go back, cause she's almost done. Yeah, we are getting there. Just gonna check my edges again. And I think we left that iron on, didn't we? The okay. little Alyssa iron? Yeah. Okay, good. And we are at the end, yes! <laughs> All righty, how does that look? And now we are going to open it up and check ourselves out and see how we did on our points. Let's try this one too. Make sure he looks pretty good. 
Look at there. Right. See, doesn't that look good? It's not the end of the world if they don't match. Don't critique yourself too much. And we're going to press this seam allowance open. So, okay. let me get my little wool pressing mats. So, we're going to turn this over. I love this uh, roller. This allows you to lay your um, seams on top of it. And we are going to press these seam allowances open. Now, there again, you might want to mist those with water, or we can use a little best press on there that I've got over here. Of course, in the wrong place, but that's okay. We'll just do a little mist with the best press. And you could also use your clapper to really get these nice and flat. And the bottom of this um, wool opener actually is a clapper. Mm -hmm. But when you're using the top well, part, you can use the bottom part. That's right. Good point. Mm -hmm. I tell you, too, uh, treating your fabric with that Tyrio Magic can really help. And, um, you know, let's see how this is popping up on me right here. That's what drives me crazy. Because then when you come around there, it's very possible that that little seam, you'll get into trouble with it. So let's move that bad boy over. Let's give him another little bounce of heat. And let's give him a clap, why don't we? Let's <laughs> see if we can. Let's treat him to all the specials. That's right. Now look at him. How wonderful is that? And I'm going to go all the way down this piece, get him all pressed up nice and neat. And then we are going to pick out our backing fabric. And we are going to uh, spray baste and then pin baste those layers together. And we want to show you how to do that also. So you won't be terrified when you get ready to start. And you want to use the pins. The pins are important because that spray base is uh, temporary adhesive. So uh, it's going to loosen up some over time. Now, if you spray a lot on it, it's going to last longer. But if you're going to get to the project, you know, quickly, then save your product and uh, just do a few pins in there to hold it also. All right. So we'll get this finished up. And then we're going to show you how to do all that as well. So Brandy and I have been busy while you guys have been resting. We've been busy, and so we've got a portion of our uh, runner already attached. So I'm going to talk to you just a little bit. I took two widths of fabric, and I seamed them together. And I don't know if you notice on any, all of this, there were no salvages. So the first thing I always do is get rid of those salvages on my fabric. So I've seamed my fabric together, and I always like to have an inch and a half or two inches extending around all the sides of, of my uh, project that I'm working on. And then I pressed it really, really good. And the first thing I did was I sprayed 505, which we use that a lot in em embroidery, and like I said, it's a temporary spray adhesive for fabric. And so I sprayed the wrong side of my backing fabric and then I smoothed my batting down. Now when you do this, you actually want to start in the middle and smooth to the outside. One thing you can do, and uh, we didn't have time to do that today, but uh, if you wanted to uh, use masking tape, and tape this fabric down so that it won't bunch up on you when you can't see it on the underneath side, you can do that and that'll keep it nice and flat for you. If you've got a cutting table or a dining room table, painter's tape, anything like that to hold those edges down. And what kind of batting did you choose for this, this table This particular runner? batting that I've got on here is a cotton batting. Quilter Stream is one of my favorite battings, and this is their cotton batting. It's very soft. They have, I think, four weights. Yeah, four weights of it. And I know you're probably used to people talking about the loft of a batting, but that only holds true when you're talking about a polyester batting, or in this case, this is a wool. So you can see 
that the batting actually is very lofty and airy. When you're talking about your batting in cotton, it's actually more of a weight. So when they put more cotton fiber per square inch, the weights get heavier and denser. This particular one is called their select weight, and it's excellent for when you're doing a machine quilting on your home sewing machine. They have a weight that's even lighter than that, than that that's called request. It's perfect for hand quilters. Then you get up into a deluxe weight and a supreme weight, and they're much heavier. And when I say heavy, I'm talking that when you're laying under that quilt, it is heavy and dense and warm because there's a lot more cotton per square inch being applied. So there again, we sprayed with 505 and got our batting smoothed down onto our fabric. Tape it down if you want to, to keep your batting, batting from or your fabric from bunching up under your batting. And then once we did that, we sprayed in sections. So start in the center again, spray your batting, or you can spray the wrong side of your uh, table runner, and start smoothing, and we smooth to the outside edge. And then you can see that we have got some nickel-plated safety pins. Now the nickel plated is what you want to use simply because they won't rust. So if you don't get to this for three or four or five years to finish it up, they're not gonna leave a rusty spot on your table runner. <laughs> also, be sure that you uh, buy the one inch pins. I've had a lot of people that come to um, my quilting classes and they'll have the really big safety pins. And you have to realize that when they're large like that, the needle itself on the pin is too large to push through your material. And when you are able to do that, it will leave a big hole. So always get the smaller size so you'll be uh, dealing with that. And it's easier to uh, quilt around those in those places that you need to. And you can see I've just sporadically placed them like so. And I think when we do our quilting, Brandy, I think I'm going to follow this line in the fabric and run just some straight stitch quilting. And I may come in and follow one of these lines close to the center. And then I'll come out on the outside and go around it. And then we'll do the edge. Okay. Do you think that sounds like a good plan? Sounds like a good idea. All right, so Brandy, we're gonna get this ready for them. So, like I said, we've already smoothed our backing fabric with the 505. And we've got a good portion of this done. Ooh, get that lid off. <laughs> and I'm just gonna hold my fabric up and give it a little spray. And then I take my hand, I don't know if you can see, but I'm gonna take my hand and smooth right down the center. And then we'll go outward at a downward motion on both sides. Okay. Look at that. Isn't that nice? Oh, we got such great tools. And then I'll just, oh, here's one. See one of these big guys? Now, look how much smaller the actual pin is it's going to go through your fabric than that so, so when you inner pin yes oh. the diameter of the actual pin so when you're trying to push that through your table runner your batting and your backing it's hard for you to get it through and then you'll actually end up leaving a really big hole in your fabric okay. let me have that quick clip can you hand him to me sure now we can't get these any longer but I tell you what you can use. What this guy does is it saves your finger from getting stabbed. Because you know when you're trying to put in a, a safety pin, you you know, you know push it down into your fabric. And then when you come up, you're trying to do this to get that tip out. And so that's where this guy comes into play. And then you, you have little slots in the end here. There you go. Now, you can't get that guy anymore. You can't get him anymore. But before we had him, I used a teaspoon. You know, so maybe they'll start making it again. And uh, if so, we'll we'll get it and get it on the website. We'll get you guys a tablespoon. Mm -hmm. And he's called a quick clip. 
I hate they quit making those. They're so handy. Yeah. Now you can also buy <laughs> curved safety pins. So either one, whether they're the straight or the curved, e either one of them will work well for you. Okay, so Brandy and I got this finished up and we're gonna start doing some quilting and look who we have. This is Susan. She's one of our friends that shop here. And how long have you been shopping at the store? Uh, since Gina opened up in the barn. In the barn. Gosh, that was back barn. in the 80s. I was, I was in my mid, mid young 30s. We don't even talk about Young 30s, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so if you don't know, Gina's been in business for 42 years. And she's been a Bernina dealer for 38. So mm -hmm. we've been around a long time. So mm -hmm. we've raised kids together and everything. But she's taken a beginning quilting class. So... I'm gonna let her show you uh, what she's worked on. And she's coming in today for me to help her get her going a little bit further. So I just told her to come on in and watch a video with us. So she's brought her quilt and it's beautiful fall colors. Yeah, we started this in the fall, so this is- Yeah, COVID kind of got in the yeah, way, it did. didn't it? But isn't that pretty? Beautiful. So we are going, she's got hers pin basted, so we are going to work on quilting. So she came in at just the perfect time. All right. Alrighty. So um, I tell you what I've done. I, I have, uh, don't do what I did. I sat down in that chair the other day and I fell forward out of it. So um, I am gonna put on my Bernina walking foot for this. Now, I know we have dual feed in the machine, but I get a lot better results with my walking foot, depending on the weight of batting that I'm using. And so I thought I would just talk to you a little bit about the walking foot and let you understand when you buy one, what all these attachments are that come with it. So let's just talk about the sole plates. The first uh, walking foot that we ever had that Bernina made, it only came with this one sole plate and it was attached to the foot and could not be removed. And so you can see here's where the needle travels and it has a bar between the two toes and you did have a center mark line on it to help you. And you have to realize the walking foot really wasn't designed for quilters. We just jumped on it and fell in love with it. So. Uh, so this was our first one that we had. And then uh, we begged to have one that did not have this bar that uh, ran between uh, the, the, shoot, I can't even talk, between the two sides and in front of the needle. And we wanted to have more visibility. So the next one that they came out with is the one that that bar is removed so that you can kind of see where you're going. Okay, well, we weren't satisfied and we wanted something for stitching in the ditch. So they added a guide for us that we can actually put that guide in the ditch of our seam and it will keep us exactly in place when we're doing our quilting. Okay, isn't that cool to have Very that? Cool. Now, how you remove and attach the different ones, there's a screw on the side of the white box of the foot and you just unscrew it to the left. And as you do that, you're gonna see the black bars widen apart from each other. See how this, and there we go. It came <laughs> off very easily, didn't it? And so that's how you remove it. And then to put the next one on, you simply slip it up and line up. There's some little posts on these black pieces. I don't know if you can see right there. You see that, Susan? Mm -hmm. See those little guys? Mm -hmm. And they fit in the holes okay. on the foot. So you get one side lined up, and you might want to hang on to your foot this time so you won't fly off into the wild open spaces. And then we just start screwing that screw back in, and that arm will start going in. And after a little while, you could just hear it kind of click into place and then finish tightening it down. Okie doke. Which one are you using? I'm this sure. one, I think since we're going to travel and follow these lines, I think I'll use the one that has the um, the bar cut out from between the toes. Now, um, also, if you're doing channel quilting, you have some guides that come with the foot. You have one that goes on the right side when you're stitching in that way, and then you have another one that goes on the left side for those times when you're coming back. And what holds it in place is this guy. And he fits on the back of the foot. Do you have one of these, Susan? 
You know, the bar looks familiar, but I don't think I have the truck. Well, you know, we if have a bar that they come with the machine. Okay, yeah. yes, I have the bar, but not you may, I have the foot. You may want to invest in one of these. Okay, and so then this slides through, and you position it, this guide, the distance you want your channel quilting to be, you position it away from the needle. So if I wanted it one inch, I would position it over, then tighten this down. And after you've stitched that first row of stitching, and if that was our first row of stitching, we could let that guide ride along that last row of stitching. Now what this foot's gonna do for us, because of the bulk of having three layers here, it is gonna accurately feed those layers through so you don't get any pleats on the back of your quilt mm -hmm. or on the top, sometimes that can happen. So trying to do this with a regular presser foot is not gonna work for you, especially on a big quilt too. You're gonna have lots of issues with a big quilt. Oh, don't let me lose it. Get all these little pieces out of the way. Now, putting this bad boy on can be a little difficult for some people. We want to make sure that we get this hook over the needle bar right here. Can you see that, Brandy? Is it okay? And you're going to have to tilt the foot in to scoop him up on that in the back. And then you're going to slip this up and on. So it can be a little bit of a booger, but maybe, let me leave my head over so I can see we got it and then latch him down. Now, if you're sewing on the Bernina machines that have you tell it what presser foot you have on the machine, it will not allow you to use the automatic needle threader like the eight series, hmm. because the automatic needle threader will hit the foot and it might damage your needle threader. Uh, I have gotten by with using this, but I generally just try to have my needle threaded before I put the foot on. Okay. okay, now we are going to start doing our quilting. And I think where I'll start is kind of inconspicuously <laughs> somewhere. Oh, and another thing too, I think I'll go back into settings on my machine and I'm gonna tell it, I'm gonna turn on my securing stitch. So we've got that done. And then I'm gonna go in here and I'm going to add to my thread cutter that it secures my stitch before I, or before it cuts the thread. So that way at the beginning it's going to lock them and at the end it's going to lock them. And I never start, I try to start in an inconspicuous place. So let's see which line of this blue am I going to try to stitch on. Nah, it's not going to be a straight line, but we're just going to make it work. I'm gonna go ahead and take this pin out in preparation. And once again, you know me, I gotta hold those threads when I start so I won't get any of those bird's nests underneath there. See how it's securing? Now where's your light? We turned the light off because, because of it this. was not okay. doing well with the video. Okay. And I have changed my needle to a size 80 microtex needle. And I've got it slowed down a little bit too, Susan, so mm -hmm. I won't go so mm -hmm. fast that it makes a lot of noise, but normally I floor it when I quilt. I'm crazy sometimes with it. So you by all means can sew a little bit faster. And I'll just get this pin out of my way before I stitch over it. And what I, my intentions are is to quilt around this center, just following these little lines of the fabric. And this is just straight line quilting. Oh, and listen, if you guys don't have a machine that has an auto needle threader on it, then what you might want to do, maybe I'll show that. I'll show that in a little bit. I, I don't like to hit reverse and back up on on my quilting. Ooh, and you know what else I should have said in my settings? Let's just go and fix that. Okay. We are going to set it to do a hover. So whenever my machine puts my needle down, I wanted to raise my presser foot so I don't have to do it. Lift, my dear, lift. 
Okay, you may not do it the first time after I've set it. All right. And there again, I wouldn't worry myself too much with being, now see, put my needle down so I can pivot and it lifted my foot for me. So you are not stitching on a seam. No. You are just doing some straight I'm line following, on this I'm mat. following that. Okay. Yeah, so we're trying to make this very simple. Okay. You know, for anybody so they can they can quilt. This is gonna be a good beginner project for most people. Okie dokie. Lift it up again. See, that's just gonna be enough to hold it. And it's a cute table runner. Mm -hmm. I okay. love the fabric. I do too. So Let's, that came as a panel. It is a border fabric border and panel. you can get two table runners out of but was it a yard and a quarter, I think? All right, but you can see how beautifully that's feeding that through. Look at this line of stitching. And that's what this walking foot will do for you. It's gonna make sure that it doesn't ease in any fullness along your stitching. It was originally designed for home deck. Did you okay, know that? no, I did not. And so uh, there was actually, in the factories, there were actually machines that did nothing else. They were set up just to be an even feed foot. And that way they could sew 30, 40, 50 yards of fabric together and not mm -hmm. worry when they got to the end that one layer was going to be, you know, short or shorter than the other. Generally, without a foot like this, the feed dogs will feed the bottom layer of your fabric a little bit faster than the top layer. But with this foot, it has feed dogs in the top. And mm -hmm. so they're gonna move the top at the mm -hmm. same time. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now I love this for my quilting because these feed dogs go in front of the needle as it pulls it through, which for all this bulkiness, that's excellent. The dual feed is great for two, a couple of layers and small quilted projects, but that dual feed is pulling from behind the needle. So I really like to use my walking foot whenever I'm doing machine quilting. We've also got this machine on a, a very wiggly table, you guys. Mm -hmm. So just so you know, if she wants to go faster, uh, but this table, um, we don't have the insert in, so. Yeah. Just ignore um, a little bit of that wobble. Yeah, when it's sitting on top of the machine or on top of mm -hmm. the table, it's not the best setup. All so right. For, for today, it does work. Maybe next time we'll put the machine down and needle down and it lifts. Isn't that nice to not have to mm -hmm. stick your hand down there? And you did not change the length of your stitch. About a three or a little bit longer would okay. be good. Okay. I don't know what I've got it set at, but you have to kind of judge that stitch length according to the weight of batting. Mm -hmm. So the heavier the project you're working on, whether you're quilting or not, the heavier project that you're working on, the longer the stitch length should be for it to feed through. Okay. I'm trying to find my line here. I think you make it. I love though the there we go. So I'm pivoting right on that little seam there. So you can use your fabric a lot of times to decide how to quilt. Mm -hmm. And of course, this is a table runner, so we really don't need a lot more than that. So let me make sure I'm doing good. When you're really trusting this fabric, has a straight and line. You know, or, or if it's not, you know, okay this too. this is so wiggly anyway you that, yeah, you're just adding a little bit of texture. Okay. Now, if you wanted to mark a line, Susan, mm -hmm. to follow, if your fabric wasn't one that would give you an option like this, uh -huh. you could definitely do that. Just now, I have, yeah, you could just, just I ruler. use uh, Easy International Water Soluble Markers is what okay. I, I mm -hmm. like to use. I don't use anything on the right side of a quilt that I'm not sure will will wash out or you know, you, you've heard about some of the pins that you can iron them off, but mm -hmm. then they come back in cold weather. So I don't mind doing that in construction, but certainly not on the right side of my project. Okay. All right, now if y'all remember, I've set the machine up to where when I cut my threads, it's gonna lock stitches. 
locks and now it's cut okay now it's it's totally up to you as to you know how you want to move to the next section but i'm just going to slide it over hold that needle thread and we're going to do that second row and i won't make you watch all this so we're going to finish up our quilting and then when you come back we're going to square it up and do some binding which i think susan's excited to watch. all right so um i've already gone ahead and trimmed um uh, some of this excess off but i don't know if you can see this is just the simple quilting that we did so when you're a beginner you don't necessarily have to start out with a lot of uh, heavy quilting so we've just got three lines of quilting and then i did go around and stitch about a quarter of an inch away from the outer edge in preparation for binding and i just thought i'd talk to you a little bit about doing your rotary cutting and uh, so we're going to line the ruler up and our edges are pretty nice and even so um, you know we don't have to really trouble ourselves with anything but when you're using a rotary cutter and i think i may have mentioned before these perforations that are in there for you to put your index finger on and you want to start cutting away from like here i've already cut so you want to start your cutting back away from that I move my hips out of my way so that my arm is straight from my hand up to my shoulder. So you don't want to be like this because your shoulder jumps up in the air when you're like that. So move your body out of the way, put your index finger on the perforation and slant it upwards so you can straighten out your wrist. So you don't want this going on, just up like that. You got a nice straight arm up to your shoulder and then I'm going to walk my hand up my ruler. And if you've put those grips on the bottom, that helps you immensely. And we're going to get this trimmed. And then we're going to talk about the binding. Because one of the most important parts of your binding is the uh, beginning and end, where you join those pieces together. And I'm going to trim this after I get my foot off of it because I was standing on it. And I may trim off this little bit of excess here. I'm going to use the point here and this point as my guide. That looks a little wavy to me. And the arm goes up. And I hope that'll help you a little bit. The thing is, I think a lot of people push too hard on the rotary cutter. And if you've got a really nice sharp blade and you hold it up at an angle, because this is in the palm of your hand, the weight of your hand should be enough pressure on it to do a cut and always close your, close your blade. So we've got that trimmed. Look how much better it already looks. Just getting that trimmed off. Isn't that beautiful? That's gonna be such a pretty one, isn't it? it Here in so the back pretty. and you can see more of her quilting a little easier to see the lines she did and again she just followed the fabric mm -hmm. okay now I've already got my binding made but never fear I'm not gonna leave you all out so this is I want to thank four widths of fabric that I have joined together and you want to join this on the diagonal. Can you see my stitching line here? See, we've joined it on the diagonal. And we want to do that because your eye is not drawn to an angle of stitching like it is a straight line of stitching. Now, how we're going to do that, let me just tell you this too. After I've got them all joined together, then you press them wrong sides together. Now, I uh, cut my strip two and a quarter inches wide times the width of the fabric. And I didn't worry about removing the salvages because they're gonna be cut off when we seam them together. And that was how I got them prepared. So when you're ready to uh, adjust, uh, bleh, bleh, attach your pieces <laughs> together. <laughs> oh goodness, I'm behind. We're actually in the store today and so we have a lot of interruptions and things that take place so we're in a working store environment so we get sidetracked a lot when we're doing these 
Now, when you want to sew on the diagonal, this is just my tip. When you put your pieces right sides together, I always let a little bit of the fabric extend beyond the edges. And we're going to sew from corner to corner. And what you always want to remember, and I hope there's a way that I can get this across, is you don't want to start sewing from the outside edge of this piece toward the inner point of the binding should always start inside and sew to the outside of that intersection. In the out. And if you are in doubt, just put your hand on it and flip it over to make sure you're thinking correctly. Because when you sew it this way, <laughs> something is just not happy, as We've you can see. <laughs> yes, yes. All right. Let me see now what we've got changed and let me clear it out and get us back to normal. Get that stitch length down a little bit. Okay. And so I'm going to sew on the die. You know, now if you're more comfortable, you can mark yourself a line. If it'll make you feel better. Whoops. Gonna put that dual feed down. Or what am I gonna get, Brandy? Pucker teens. Mm -hmm. Ah, I need to turn that off too. And then we're going to sew at an angle. And we will be good to go. All right. Now see how I've got this stitched? And then when I open it up, look what I've got. Perfect. And because I overlap those edges, it makes it possible for you to not have anything hanging over there. You know, if you're trying to put the ends together like this you know and then sew over it you'll never make it so always overlap it don't try to match up that square just overlap it just a little bit and then you'll be sewing from that inner corner to that inner corner and then at that point we would trim off this seam allowance trim it down to about a quarter of an inch And then you'll press all your seams open, like so. Okay. Do you always sew open on a binding? I do. It cuts down on the bulk okay. on all the binding. So let's look at this that I've already made and put together. I can't remember whose video I was watching. And when they made all their binding, they would buy fabric just to use for binding. And they rolled it on uh, paper towel rolls, you know. And so, you know, I didn't do it, but you, you probably want to cut off all your little dog tails that are sticking out. Okay. But you can do that at any time. Okay. So we're ready to attach our binding. Now, the way I'm going to show you today, there's lots of different ways to do it. You can do any way you want to, but this is what we're going to teach you today. We'll be doing other ways. But um, I try not to sew, start sewing exactly in the center of the length of the piece I'm working on. I want to throw the eye off just a little bit. So, and if you also wanted, you could put you a little pin and say, okay, I want my binding to start and stop right there. Okay. If you want it to, if that make you feel better. And be sure and leave yourself a nice long piece of fabric. Okay. Any questions about that? Because the measurement you use for this binding is just with the fabric. Well, the measurement on cutting the width of it, I'll adjust it. If my batting is thicker, I might add, you know, a little bit more rather than two and a quarter. I might go up two and three eighths. Uh, actually, I wish I had cut this two and an eighth inches wide before I folded it. <clears throat> but I just went with two and a quarter for the sake of getting it done. But I think two and an eighth would have been a better fit when I fold it around. Okay, so we're going to leave lots of fabric here. And I'm going to start. And I've got the cut edges of the binding on the cut edge of the placemat. And if this is where I want to start, I'm going to begin my stitching below that about six inches. This is where I want it to meet together. Okay. So we want to have a lot of space between our starts and stops so that we can manipulate our uh, fabric. 
Try not to pull. And another thing about binding uh, too, you can cut it on the grain if you don't have any curved edges. Uh, you can also cut it on the bias. It's a personal preference, just whatever you want to do. Uh, always, the, it was, you know, they always said, always cut it on the bias. It will wear better. And, uh, but I have cut on the grain as well. And these uh, table mats really don't have any severe corners to deal with. So we'll just do kind of a little baby miter down there. And you're still doing a quarter inch seam, right? Mm -hmm, definitely. Okay. So when I get down to here, I am going to stop sewing approximately a quarter of an inch away from this edge. And how do I know when I get there, I can use the notches on the foot. The one in front of the needle is exactly a quarter of an inch away from the needle. So we're gonna use that. You could probably eyeball and hit that too. And yes, I better slow down. No, just, okay. So now we're here at the corner and we can, if you want to, you can take it out. But what I like to do, let me put that needle back down in there. And this is just me. You guys don't have to do that. But what I like to do is I like to turn and I kind of stitch that at an angle and that almost shapes my miter for me. Does that make any sense? Mm -hmm. And then we're gonna flip this up like so. My stitching line is my guide. And then fold this down and we'll continue on down our placemat. And that's what I'm gonna do on every single one of those points. And I'm going to stitch all the way around. And when we get to the end, I'm going to show you how to join the two ends together to where you don't even notice them. Whoop, my needle came up here. Didn't I get a hold of my thread? I think I had the bobbin thread in my hand, not the needle thread. <laughs> What do you think, Brandy? Think it looks pretty good? It looks really great. I love the color. Dude, that is a pretty color for the binding, Came together isn't it? So quickly. Okay. Hey, let's check out these corners, guys. So um, now I stitch my binding down on the right side and turn it under to the back. But you could do this same process. A lot of people like to stitch theirs on the back and bring it to the front. So it's totally up to you which way that this is gonna work either way. Now, and here's where we did that little miter. So now look how pretty that's gonna look when we get ready to fold it to the back. See, you got your cute little miter. Perfect. What do you think? And even up here on this big old point, you know, we're gonna have a pretty little miter up there when we get them all folded under. Isn't Perfect. that cool? All right, and two guys, if you need more help on this, you can come into the shop. Now, this is the big dilemma, is where your binding starts and stops. How do you join it? Well, the first thing you want to do is even, and I think I had a pin right here. If this is where you want uh, them to join, make sure you leave yourself a lot of space in between where you started your stitching and where you ended. Actually, I could have left a couple of more inches and it would made it easier for us when we have to bend the quilt together. So the more space you leave, the easier it gets, but not more than 12 inches. So I'm going to take this strip and what I'm going to do, ooh, we always get scared when we start cutting. We are going to cut this off 
where we want the binding to kind of end, okay? Now this piece will end up going over it, just like this. Let me make sure I smooth that down nice and smooth. So how much do you know, I mean, how do you know how much to cut off of this piece to make them join together? So what I've done is I have snipped off a piece of my binding, just like this. I am going to position it on top and I'm gonna open this up. This is the width that we cut our binding, that two and a quarter inches. And I am going to lay this to where the edge of this piece is on top of the end of the binding that's underneath. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. You think that explanation will do it? And this is where we're gonna cut. This is the top piece of binding that's overlapping and we're gonna cut on this side. You'll only do this once <laughs> if you cut it on that side because then it'll be too short. And listen, every time I do this beginning and ending, I have to look it up and watch it again because you're not, this is not something you're doing every single day. So in between quilts, you may have to refresh your memory. So I'm gonna lay this. This is just my measuring tool. We'll throw it away when we get through with it. And then I just slip my scissors under there and cut. Or if you wanted to, you could mark you a line, okay? I'm just gonna try to do it. Well, maybe I won't do it that way. <laughs> I, I wanna be accurate for you guys. So maybe I'll flip that over and kind of do me a finger crease right there. And then I have like a little place I can cut. Does that make sense, what mm -hmm. I just said? Yep. Can they see it from that angle? Yep. Okay, all right. So we're gonna do this and I'm just gonna cut on that little crease fold that I made. All right, so we got our two pieces. Cool. Yay. Now open this up. This is the one that's on the bottom. Open it up and fold it because we're gonna stitch on the diagonal. Fold the diagonal edge and see I'm taking this corner tip that's toward the inside of my piece and I'm folding it here. See, if I'd left a little bit more room, this would be easier for me to do. And finger crease it. And we're gonna stitch on that line in a minute that we created. Alrighty. And before you let go of what you've put in there, unfold this piece. Let me pull this up. See why we need a lot of room? And place it right there on this edge. You got it? So this is folded on the diagonal. And then we're gonna do this. And I hope I'm telling you correctly, cause like I said, then pick it up. And we are gonna stitch on that diagonal line that we folded in. And then when you open it up, hopefully, that's what we're gonna get, okay? And you can always check it. If you wanna check before you sew to make sure you put it together right, which I highly recommend, just put you some pins on that fold line. And we'll see whether I've got it laying on there wrong or not. Okay. And then that way you can actually see what you're gonna have. See right there? Perfect. All right, so we did it right. So it's always a good idea to check yourself. And now I'm gonna take it over to the ironing board and we're gonna stitch this. The ironing board. I mean, over, over to the sewing machine, machine. <laughs> I got sidetracked. We're almost done with the project, guys. Yeah, I bet we're you guys almost are as happy as we and are. And we're going to stitch this strip together. And when we come back, I'll show you how to stitch it down all the way around. Hey guys, we have got our binding partially stitched down. So I've left some so you can see, you know, how I do it. Uh, 
this is the back of it and we're just using a straight stitch now there's lots of different stitches that you can use to give your bi your binding a little more up but we're just using a straight stitch today and we're going to do more binding videos later on and uh, maybe talk about putting a flange in your binding and some piping or rick rack some fun things like that so we'll be doing videos on that as well but we're keeping this one kind of simple to make it easy for the beginners too but uh check it out look how pretty it is now there again i think i told you that i stitch my binding on the right side and roll it to the back so this is what the back of mine looks like and my stitching on the top is hidden in the ditch of the seam so that's why i like to do mine um uh, you know on the right side and roll it to the back i prefer this is not what i see on the right side of my quilts okay and what foot are you using to get yeah, into that ditch so um what i'm using is the number 10 press a foot and this particular one is um d so i've got my dual feed engaged so it will feed that binding notice i don't have any little ripples in that binding at all it's because of that dual feed and this 10d presser foot has a fabulous guide now don't mistake it with your blind hem foot which is foot number five the 10 foot the guide stops before it reaches the needle area with the number five blind hem foot, you can't use multiple needle positions or different stitches with it. So that's why Bernina made us the 10 foot where this guide stops before it gets into the needle hole area. So we can use all our needle positions, decorative stitches, anything we want to use with this foot. Uh, it is the most uh, bought presser foot that Bernina has and I think the latest count there was like 50 some odd uses for number 10 so we'll be showing you you'll see that a lot more because it's one of my favorite feet now um, we've done some corners here as you can see they ended up with a nice little miter and everything and when you flip it over you can see the back okay and when I do it if you can use the wonder clips if you want to get your miter fixed and looking nice before you get to the stitch in, these wonder clips are great because it kind of crimps it in there. So when you take them out, it's all, almost like you finger press them in. They held it really strong. So they'd be pretty good. You can also use your wonder clips and clip in places all the way down your binding if you like. I've been doing this for so long that um, I don't have to do that. So let me roll over, Brandy. I'm sorry if I get in your way. And I just take my fingers and I roll my binding back, making sure that the fold of the binding extends a little past my stitching line. All right. And then I, I don't know why I do this. I can't tell you why. It's just a habit. I'll take my finger and rub down it. But you should be able to feel the edge of that fold extending past. And then this guide is going to be right in that ditch and keep me perfectly in place as I stitch down. And we'll go around one of the uh, points for you. It's not hard to do at all. Sewing like a wild woman. You don't have to sew this fast, of course. This might be a, a good time for you to remember to set your machine if you have this option in the needle, position, de, blip, blip, needle down position so that when you have to reposition your hands, it will hold your, uh, your project in place under the needle. Like I say, these wonder clips are great. It'll prevent you from stabbing yourself, you know, by using straight hands, but whatever works for you. And they have little metal parts, so they still mm -hmm. go into your magnetic pin cushion. Yeah. Now, I'm going to pop this little guy off, and you can see that because I've had that on there, it's really kind of finger press that miter in for me. And I'm going to slow down. So we're going to sew all the way down to this inner point, inner corner, I guess maybe would be the best way to phrase it. All the way down, just take your time and watch, and then put the needle down in that inner corner and then turn line the bar back up in the ditch of your seam 
double check your binding to make sure it's folded over enough to extend past that stitching line. And we've got that one down. So these aren't really difficult. Once you get this far along, the worst is over. Just gonna hold it right there so I can see that inner corner. I'm gonna check in to make sure that needle's actually in the corner. Right the in guide, that corner. The mm -hmm. guide isn't where the needle ends. Mm-hmm. And then, whoops, veered off a little bit there. Yeah, like Brandy said, those uh, clips or I have some metal in them, so your pin cushions are gonna hold them for you. All righty, and we'll do this one last corner, and we'll be ready to go to the home stretch. Perfect, got it right in there. Okay, now when you get back to where you started, and I left some little thread tails somewhere, and let, there they are. See, so I'd know where the beginning was, because when you're sewing on this side, and you're stitching in the ditch with that foot, it hides your stitching, and you don't know. So I left a little thread tail, so I'd have a visual on where I was. I don't know if you remember, but I went ahead and set my machine back up to where when I cut my, use my thread cutter, it will secure. Now, if you did not, then you just hit your reverse button, take two or three stitches in reverse, and that should be good enough. Okay, and we have our table runner completely finished. I am so excited. Can't wait to see what you guys do. No, if you it's do so sew along fun. with us, please post your oh, photos yes, on Facebook. Oh, yes, we want to see. And listen, um, I'm not professional. I know that my videos are probably a little quirky because I'm not professional in doing them. But I do love to sew. I do love to quilt. I love to make heirloom garments. And I love to share what I know. And I've been doing this for over 40 years. So I know I'm a little quirky and maybe my English is not the best and I have a really strong Southern accent, but I'm just trying to share what I know and I hope you enjoy it. So we're gonna be doing lots of things and it makes me feel so good to know y'all are gonna be watching. And if you just learn one thing from me, I'll be so happy. So you wanna tell them where to find these or any other additional information about Gina's? So we're gonna be posting our videos on YouTube. So this video will be on Gina's Pro Tips. And again, this is Gina's Bernina Sewing Center here in Knoxville. Beautiful um, Knoxville. Beautiful Knoxville. Surrounded by the Smokies. <laughs> um, we also have a Facebook page, which is Gina's Bernina Sewing Center. If you wanna follow us on Facebook and Instagram, also Gina's Bernina Sewing Center. So find us. Join us and look at this beautiful that table oh. runner. Thanks for joining us to learn how to make this. So pretty. Let's see the back so they can see all that quilting. And it's just simple line quilting. And listen, we're gonna do we're gonna do some free motion stuff. So you just hang with us. I'm gonna teach y'all how to do free motion. All right, guys. Thanks for joining us. We hope you learned something. And we love your comments. Okay, so let us know how we're doing. And if you're a customer of ours, you better let me know. Okay? <laughs> Bye, guys. Bye, everybody.